Story 1 This story was submitted to me directly by the YouTuber Deadeye4047. I have my own Wendigo story that I'd like to share with you. It's something my dad told me when I was young. Something you gotta know about my dad. He was one of those rogues that did stupid things when he was young. But he was proud of our Native American heritage. Cherokee, to be precise. This wasn't a Cherokee legend, though. This was a story he picked up in the New England area of the US, but he told me a lot of it lined up with his own experience when he was young, as well as Cherokee mythology. Give or take a few details. He was told this story from a travelling Algonquin native at a bonfire on a beach. This had to be in the mid to late 80s, given that I was born around a decade later. Long ago, there were giants whose heads pierced the clouds. Among these giants was the cold one, Wendigo. He had ice-blue skin and was covered with snow-white hair. His breath was as cold as death and powerful, and he hated life. So, he killed the giants, making the mountains and Mother, their name for Earth or the ground, curse him with immortality at the end of his own centuries-long life. And Father, their name for the sky, stripped the Wendigo a portion of his power, thus shrinking him greatly and causing him to sleep for most of the year, save for the three to four months we call winter, when we feel his influence on the world. One day, a thousand years later, two young men were playing when they heard pleas for help deep in the woods. The two men tried to follow the voice to lend assistance until they got hopelessly lost. After the voice stopped completely, the area got increasingly colder and colder. After a few days of no food or water trying to return home, noticing they were being watched by flocks of owls and crows, one of the young men, desperate for survival, killed the other with a large rock, eating his flesh and drinking his blood for meagre sustenance. There was a loud, haughty laughter, and the area grew white with snow, and a voice said, You are now my son, for how could you ever be forgiven by your sin? Thus, I claim you. The man grew painfully in length, thin and spindly. One could say as thin as a twig, though his head could hide within the treetops. His skin grew pale and rough with black circles everywhere around him that seeped a black, sappy liquid. His fingers, long and sharp. His head lacked a jaw and eyes and ears replaced with black voids. But he retained a monstrous mouth with teeth that acted more like a blender than anything else. He became son of Wendigo. And Wendigo sent two messengers, White Crow and Owl who taught Son of Wendigo how to mimic the voices of others. Son of Wendigo used this to great effect, becoming an instrument of death. Man nor woman, young nor old, wise nor foolish was safe from Son of Wendigo's voracious appetite. Owl's children became Son of Wendigo scouts. Son of Wendigo's sight became linked to them and the beech trees that he shared visage of. Centuries later, when colonists came from across the sea, there was an anonymous colony of friendlier, if still devout colonists, that traded happily with the local population of Algonquin natives, the storyteller's ancestors, and settled on an island just offshore. Just before the colonists' first winter, the natives made sure to tell them of the Wendigo's awakening and his son's indiscriminate, unending hunger, warning them of what may come to pass. When they left, and far from earshot, the colonists joked about Wendigo and Son of Wendigo by twirling their thumbs and calling them, saying, fiddlesticks. The native's pagan way doesn't exist, right? The only truth there is, is God and the Bible. Right? And we need only fear Satan and the unclean pagan. Right? Well, the first resupply barge was very late and the natives didn't come to trade or give respite, as they regularly did. So they sent three hunters ashore with canoes to hunt for any kind of food, and if possible, 
see about their clean pagan friends. They hunted for hours to no avail, until they heard screams of terror and rushed towards it to lend assistance. Then the screams moved from one direction to another, then split three ways. The hunters split up to find sources until all screams stopped. Then one started up again. One of the hunters was screaming this and that for God and his friends to save him. The two hunters regrouped and sprinted towards their comrade. As they got closer, the scream seemed to originate higher into the trees. Then they saw it. The thin, gangling, pale monstrosity, bleeding and twisted around the branches of an oak, surrounded by bleeding beeches and owls. After it knew that it was discovered, it dropped its mimicry and spoke as though it were breathing in its words. God, please help me. Sweet Jesus, no. With that, they ran back to the shoreline but only one made it back to the colony. He was put on trial for the murder of the other two hunters, but no matter what he said, or how he tried to prove the legitimacy of his pleas by kissing and hugging the Bible, they twirled their thumbs, mumbling, fiddlesticks. Thus, they hung him. When the supply barge finally returned two months late with fresh food and new colonists, they set upon the most unusual sight. The colony was absolutely empty. Aside from a few tipped over chairs and a dented candlestick, there was no sign of any struggle. The only other evidence that anyone had been there at all were the documented files of the hunter's trail and a name carved into the hanging tree. Fiddlesticks. Then, my dad asked the native what owl looks like. My dad was familiar with native terminology, which made things easier to understand. It is said that he is pure white, and he drips his feather tips in human blood, he said. This scared my dad, and he began telling him of a time when he was very young and had a fever dream of a white owl with red-tipped feathers speaking to him. He told the native man that it spoke to him. Well, the owl said to my dad, I don't know. He forgot how to speak Cherokee by the time I was born and couldn't tell me but a few words that I can't remember myself. This made the native spring up and attempt to kill my dad with his bare hands, calling my dad, son of Wendigo, in his own language and in English, vowing to kill the evil before it is born. My dad was a hell of a fighter in his own right and subdued the native until others came around to split up the fight. Ultimately, they had to knock out the native man to get him to stop fighting. My father swore off drugs and heavy drinking after that. But that's the story my dad told me, at least. Notice the lack of similarity between this Algonquin's version of the Wendigo, Fiddlestick's son of Wendigo, and the mainstream's version. No antlers. I have a theory that, if Fiddlesticks is real, he doesn't have antlers naturally, but uses sticks, branches and deer antlers to lure hunters in and eat them. Before I move on to the next story, I just want to say thank you for choosing to watch this video and I hope you're enjoying my narration. If you are, please go ahead and hit the like button and if you don't already, subscribe to my channel. Also, please leave a comment on this video because that really helps me out. The remaining stories have been submitted to me directly by writers who wish to remain anonymous. Story 2 I have always believed that myths and superstitions were never real. All of my adult life, my mum, who was a lover of tradition and culture, tried so hard to convince me of its value and realty. But a doubting Thomas like me, who felt I was too grown to believe such things, made sure I called her bluff. I held this belief for so long until I got the shock of my life, which, to this moment, gives me goosebumps and sends chills down my spine. Of course, I never told anyone because no one would believe me anyway. I would probably be sounding like I've gone crazy. My family had gone on summer vacation in one of the cabins belonging to my grandfather close to the creeks in the countryside. One early afternoon, we had taken a walk through the woods, down to the creek. The trees were canopy-like, 
so it made everywhere a little dark, even though the sun was blazing. My sisters were already taking a swim, but I had my eyes fixated on my phone, lying on a makeshift blanket on the grasses. Just then, my eyes caught something move deep in the trees. I never paid much attention to the movement, as I was so engrossed chatting with a buddy of mine. And I also believe the movement was definitely from someone who wanted to take a swim just like us. After a moment of not seeing or hearing anyone approach, I became a little conscious. That's when I called the second movement. With a corner of my eye, I saw it take a step closer. I could see a form that appeared like a very tall bag of bones with long horns. I wasn't quite sure of what I saw, because I wasn't looking straight at it. I was almost too afraid to look up and stare squarely at it. When I did, I couldn't see anything. I chuckled inwardly and told myself I was so paranoid I needed to quit watching horror movies. I convinced myself that it was the movie I had seen the previous night that kept messing with my brain. However, I couldn't quite shake off the feeling that settled in me right from that moment. I couldn't quite explain it. A dark, eerie feeling that settled deep and hung heavy on my chest. I got cold. Very cold that my teeth slightly trembled. I took glances all around to be sure that nothing was lurking. And truthfully, I saw nothing. At least not at that very moment. Just my sister splashing water and not aware of any feeling I had or anything I might have seen. I called out to my sisters and told them we had to go home. They both shrieked at the abruptness as it was barely up to an hour since we had come. They said they weren't ready to go and called me a joy killer. Of course, I couldn't quite tell them my reasons for the sudden change of heart. I would have just gone home, but it would be quite immature and inconsiderate leaving them out there. After all, I was the big brother who needed to walk through the valleys and shadow of death to protect them. After two extra hours of my sisters swimming and having a good time, but for me, two hours of constant uneasiness and dancing glances all around scouting the environment, we finally went home. Do you believe in Wendigos? I asked my mum later that evening, while she was making dinner in the kitchen. My mum looked me up sharply as though pricked with a needle. First of all, she was already surprised that I would be hanging around in the kitchen while she made dinner. I never did that. I was more like the son who spent most of his time in his room on his phone or playing video games. So seeing me comfortably seated in the kitchen was an unusual development. Then, hearing me ask about Wendigos threw her off balance, and she glared at me suspiciously like I wasn't okay. You mean the mythical creatures with horns and bones and all? said to feed on human flesh, she asked me. That's if I remember correctly her exact question. My mum answered me, saying she believes in the existence of anything, whether ghosts, demons or mythical creatures. She said, if the world could exist, then other things equally could. Her answer didn't quite sit right with me. But this time, I didn't argue. I let it go. The creek had a secluded section with electric fishes that glowed in the dark. Before the creek ordeal earlier in the day, I had promised my sisters that I would be going to the creek at night to get some pictures of the glowing fishes. Within me, I was already sceptical about going to the creek again, but my sisters kept reminding me about the pictures I had to take. At some point, I got angry at myself for feeling like a little kid scared of monsters hiding under his bed or lurking in the closet. I stood looking at the mirror, giving myself two small slaps, reminding myself that what I saw was a figment of my imaginations. And to fully convince myself, I set out for the creeks with nothing but a torchlight and my phone. A decision I still regret to this moment. Sometime around 7pm, I wasn't quite sure of the exact time. I'd put on my jacket as it was slightly chilly and set out into the woods. My heart was racing, but I tried so hard to quieten it. 
it failed anyway. I threaded the woods like I was going for a jog, partly because I was afraid of the shadows, and the other part was I wanted to look unbothered. I forced my mind to focus on every other thing, but the fact that I was out at night, alone in the woods, and possibly going to be mauled by something I wasn't sure of. My tactic was working, but suddenly I heard a twig snap. I knew it wasn't from me. I had heard it from a distance. I wanted to ignore it, but I also heard what sounded like ruffling of dried leaves. I stopped in my tracks and looked around, even though I was too scared to. The hair on my body stood straight. The same eerie and cold feeling I had felt during the day settled in me again, weighing in my chest. I couldn't quite explain it, but the feeling was like I had knots in my stomach. I darted my eyes about. I saw nothing. Just me, the trees and the night. I breathed a sigh of relief and gave off a hearty laugh. A laugh that was a comic relief to my frightful emotions built up since the afternoon. A laugh that assured me my mind played tricks on me. Just when my laughter faded away, and I raised my head to continue my journey down the creek, I saw it. Right in front of me, about twelve feet away. It was dark, but the moonlight which tore through a scanty area in the canopy branches was enough for me to see it. A wendigo. The creature was gaunt to the point of emaciation, its skin so light and flat that it plastered over its bones, its bones pushing against its skin like a tattered plastic bag. Its eyes were sunken and glowing like liquid fire, and then horns sprouting from its goat-shaped head like an elk's. I closed my eyes and opened them again, but I still saw the monstrous creature I stared in horror, and my mouth went dry. My brain told me to run, yet I couldn't. At that moment, I wasn't sure if I was dreaming or perhaps having a very vivid mental picture. All I knew was that I wanted it to stop. Nothing prepared me for what I was looking at. I have only heard about Wendigos from books and some horror movies I had seen. According to myth, They were known to feed on human flesh and prey on the weak and socially disconnected. I wondered if that was why I was haunted by the sight of this creature, for giving my friend some space and recoiling into my shell. My thoughts were interrupted by the Wendigo as it snarled at me in a low growl, revealing sharp teeth like a saber-toothed tiger. Right then, I didn't need anybody to tell me that it was a reality and I needed to run. My legs tore out in a race of their own accord, at the same time I was looking back to see if the creature followed, but it didn't. Some leafy branches slapped at my face and body painfully as I made my way through, but that wasn't my ultimate concern. All I could think of was how I was going to die in the woods with no one knowing what had happened to me. How was I going to be killed by something I never even believed in the existence of? If I died... I would just be a boy who barely just became an adult and never got to experience my life to its fullest. My legs caught into a root and I twisted my ankle slightly and fell. Just like horror movies, this is the point the characters usually died. I couldn't get up immediately, not because my legs hurt so bad that I couldn't stand, but because I had given up on myself. I lost the will to fight for my life. In a succumb, I just laid back down breathless, panting like a dog in heat, and waiting for whatever creature it was I saw to devour me. After what appeared to be like ages of waiting, nothing happened. I wasn't panting anymore as I had gotten enough oxygen for my body. I stood and glanced in every direction. Nothing. Towards the east, I could see the lights from our house. Home at last. I ran all the way through till I reached our doorstep. I stole one final glance behind me and then opened the door. For the first time, 
I figured my family must be crazy to have left the door unlocked. As soon as I entered my home, I made sure to lock both the back and front doors. I peeked through all the windows to see if the Wendigo was lurking in the shadows, but I still saw nothing. I was most grateful when my sisters and mum weren't downstairs to see me display such bizarre behaviour. That night, I couldn't quite sleep. I kept replaying in my mind what had happened. A very tricky part of my mind tried convincing me that I saw nothing except the handiwork of my imaginations. After all, if I truly saw a Wendigo, would it just let me go? A flesh-eating monster known for superhuman strengths and abilities. Would it just let me outrun it? Perhaps I was just losing my mind and seeing things that weren't there. If only I could somehow wipe my memory of the events of the day, my mind and soul would be more at ease. I knew if I slept and woke by morning, I might totally convince myself that I just had a very bad dream that seemed so real. In a bid to remind me by morning that it wasn't a dream, I penned down Wendigo in capital letters on my notepad. Trying to sleep was the hardest job that night. I kept seeing those eyes, the hot coals of eyes. I was almost tempted to slip into my mum's room to join her to let her hold me. Perhaps I could sleep then. I kept leaving my bed to look through the window. Still nothing. By morning, when I left my bed, the first thing I did was check my notepad. I saw it boldly written with blue ink. Wendigo. It was never a dream. Till this moment, I still have some moments I relish the dread of that night. I haven't told any soul. Not until now I got the courage to write it. My life has never felt the same since then. Every night in my dreams I always see them. The eyes of liquid fire. Story 3 Driving the minivan through a heavy rainfall in the middle of the night had not been my intention. But earlier that day, the twins, my younger sisters, had been going in and out of the toilet one after the other. I don't know what they ate that didn't sit well with them, but after giving them some Imodium tablets, they got better. But it was already late in the evening. I had taken a risk figuring out that we could still catch up with our parents who had travelled earlier in the morning to Beacon Hills for Thanksgiving. Right now, alone with my thoughts, it didn't seem like a good idea anymore. The forecast had not said anything about any rain, and that was why I took the risk. But now, it is raining cats and dogs and there is no one to talk to. I caught a glimpse of the twins cuddled together, and I couldn't help but smile. I was ten years older than the two girls, but I couldn't quantify the feelings they evoke in me. I always feel overly protective of them. I gasped and turned the steering to the left. An antelope had suddenly run across the road. Instantly, with trembling hands, I swerved the car to one side of the road as the antelope ran to the other side. I was losing control, but I tightened my grip and stepped on the brake, missing the animal at the last minute. I stopped the car, took my hands off the steering wheel, and tried to control my ragged breathing. A sudden noise from the back seat made me jolt upright. I turned around quickly, but the girls were just snoring, still fast asleep oblivious to the accident that almost occurred. A wave of fear came over me and I felt a chill in my heart. I looked out of the car and there seemed to be a figure in the woods looking back at me. I rolled up the window instantly. This was just like what happened the last time I was in Beacon Hills. That night, everyone had died except me. And Caramel, if you count a comatose patient of five years. I looked around and noticed the eerie silence and started the car quickly. I had tried to push the memories down as I drove away, but they came crashing like the ocean, overwhelming me with emotions I thought I had forgotten and buried. We were all sixteen, young and full of life at that age. 
We thought we knew everything. But how wrong we were. Caramel's best friend, Chloe, had changed her mind about her pool house. Instead, she wanted to celebrate her birthday at the abandoned house at the end of St. Julius Street. That house had always been empty since we could remember, and a lot of people had said it was haunted. But we thought it was all tall tales and it was made up by our parents because they didn't want us roaming around a house that could come crumbling down any minute. I wasn't scared that the house could be haunted, but I didn't like the idea of lying to my parents and going to an abandoned house to celebrate a birthday. But Caramel, my girlfriend, had pleaded with me to come because Chloe was her friend and it would mean a lot to her. I loved her so much that I would do anything for her. So, I agreed. I convinced my best friend Ted to come along, but he was scared and felt Chloe was acting weird. He said, Charlie, something about Chloe doesn't sit right with me. I had laughed it off, saying he was overreacting, but deep down something about Chloe made me unsettled. Ted came along with his girlfriend and I was glad because I didn't want to be alone with Chloe and her friends. Despite our initial reluctance, the party turned out to be fun. Chloe had bought a big mat which she spread out on the floor and we all sat on it and played games like truth or dare. Floyd, Chloe's boyfriend, had brought a mini speaker, so we blasted some pop music from the speaker and danced. It was all fun, until Chloe tripped while dancing. Floyd rushed towards her before she hit the ground. He caught her and smiled proudly to himself. The guy might be a douchebag sometimes, but no one could deny his love for Chloe. He helped her to her feet, but as he pulled her up, his phone slipped from his hands and tumbled down the basement. Ted rolled his eyes and looked at him with a face clearly saying, I told you so. But I shrugged and mouthed, this was not Chloe's fault. After the phone fell down the basement, there was a moment of prolonged silence and no one moved. Caramel suddenly screamed. What happened? I asked, terrified. Charlie, I saw a man beside the basement door looking at us. She answered, looking white with fear. I glanced over to the basement direction, but I didn't see anyone. Babe, there's no one there. And it was just your imagination. I smiled and patted her on the back. But I saw him, she whimpered into my arms. Baby, there's no one here except us. I thought you weren't scared. I guess you are. I smiled and rocked her. Remembering the incident now, I wished I had believed her. Just maybe if I had, we would have been able to escape and not walk directly into the lion's den. Floyd, aren't you going to get your phone? Jessie, Ted's girl, spoke for the first time that night. Floyd looked at her startled with a worried expression, but he shrugged and act as if he wasn't phased. Yeah, I was about to, he said and stood up. He had taken just two steps towards the basement when he stopped in his tracks. Someone has to follow me. I don't have a torch, Floyd said. In a horror movie, when people start diving into smaller groups, that's when they start getting murdered, Chloe piped up, looking at her fingers for cake. Why would you say something like that? Ted shouted at Chloe. We are already scared as it is. Did you have to make it worse? Chloe shrugged. Life is not for the weak. She stood up and switched on her phone torchlight. Then she walked over to Floyd and held his hand. You guys can stay here. Chloe and Floyd went inside the basement, leaving the four of us. All four of us tried not to look each other in the eye but it was futile. Jesse stood up. Let's just go. Every one of us stood up except Caramel, who didn't look too convinced. But I don't want to, Caramel screamed. Neither do I, Ted said. But it is her birthday, and I don't like her, but today is her day, so I don't want her to be sad for any reason. He turns and faces Caramel. 
she is also your best friend. Camel ran her hands across her face, frustrated, then jumped to her feet. Let's get this over with. Everyone smiled and we walked down the basement. As soon as we all got downstairs, Floyd saw his phone under a big nylon bag. He bent over to pick it up, but it was stuck under the nylon. He bends it back, then he raises it to pick his phone up. Suddenly, Floyd started screaming, jumping, and running up the stairs. Every one of us was startled. We didn't know what happened. I bent down and turned my phone torch towards the nylon and saw the unthinkable. Dead bodies. Everyone saw the bodies at the same time as me and started running up the stairs. But as soon as Floyd got to the end of the stairs leading out of the basement, it shut closed from the outside. We all ran to the door to pry it open, but it was locked. While hitting on the door, I noticed that Caramel had stopped banging the door, and she was going back towards Chloe. Chloe had not tried to escape. She was just looking at us. Caramel dragged Chloe by the wrist and pulls her up the stairs, but she pushed Caramel to the ground and started laughing sinisterly. Where are you running to? Do you think there is a way out of here? Chloe laughed again. Floyd walked back down the stairs and helped Caramel up and walked over to Chloe. I know that you're in shock, but that doesn't excuse your behavior, he reprimanded her. We are all scared. But I am hungry, Chloe bellowed in a thick, thunderous voice. Then she grabbed Floyd's arm and bit it, not letting go. Floyd screamed and tried to pry his hand from hers, but to no avail. Everyone rushed towards them and tried to help Floyd, but we couldn't pull her teeth off of him. Jessie hit Chloe with a log of wood, and she released Floyd. Floyd quickly put his hand over the wound, and Chloe licked her lips loudly. Delicious. I always knew that you would taste this good. She laughed like a possessed person and slowly raised her head, staring at us from under her lashes. We all took a step back unconsciously. We didn't understand a thing. I noticed her teeth first. Her whole dentition had changed. She looked like all her jaws were filled with canine of vampire's teeth. Her eyes had become bloodshot, and her fingers had turned into claws. Caramel's voice trembled. Chloe, if this is a joke, please stop it before it gets out of hand. Chloe laughs again and jumps on a dusty table, as she turns her head to the side and stares at Jessie. You first, Chloe concluded, as a matter of fact, and jumped on Jessie. The girl staggered to the ground as she tried to stand back up. Chloe started tearing at her flesh with her fingers and teeth, biting and eating her. There was sudden chaos as I poured Caramel and Ted towards the stairs. We were all pushing and kicking at the door except Floyd, who fell to his feet. Chloe raised herself from Jessie's lifeless body and smiled at Floyd. At that moment, it seemed Floyd got his senses back. He started dragging himself away, terrified. Chloe smiled at him again and stretched her hand out towards him. Didn't you say you would always love me? Why are you running away now? She said, licking the blood off her fingers. What are you? You killed Jessie! Floyd shouted at her with tears and mucus coming down his nose. Chloe jumped and landed right in front of Floyd and held his shoulder. He smelt his fragrance and groaned. You smell so good, she shouted excitedly, then trailed her clawed finger across his neck. You want to know what I am? She bites his ear and breathes down his neck. I am a Wendigo. What is that? Floyd stuttered, breathing heavily. I'll show you, Chloe said, and she yanks Floyd's head off his body. I screamed and intensified my kicks to the door. Chloe didn't mind us. She was busy eating Floyd's body. The door 
finally gave, and I got out of the room, followed by Caramel, then Ted. We got out of the basement and locked the door. Then we ran out of the house as quickly as we could. When we got out, we saw the car we had brought earlier and ran towards it. The key should be with Floyd. He drove us here, I said, running my hand through my hair, frustrated. Ted didn't say anything. Instead, he started looking for something on the ground. He found what he was looking for. It was a stone. He broke the window of the driver's seat. Then he puts his hand through the window and opens the door. He drags some wires and started the car. I and Caramel entered the car quickly, and Ted started driving. No one said a word. We were shocked out of our minds. Then, right in front of us, Chloe and a man stood in front of the road. Ted started slowing down. No, don't slow down. That's what they want, Caramel shouted. Don't you dare slow down, I also shouted. Ted increased his speed as soon as I spoke and drove through them. Chloe jumped on the car trunk and punched the glass. Ted got hit and lost consciousness. The car swerves and fell into a ditch. Chloe hadn't jumped out of the way quickly, so she was trapped under the car, unable to move. Caramel had flown out of the car through the front seat when the accident happened and hit her head on a big rock at the bottom of the ditch. Ted's neck was slashed by Chloe before she went under the car, and I was under Ted's lifeless body, unable to move. I heard the sound of someone approaching the car. It was the man beside Chloe earlier. I peered a little, while making sure I wasn't moving, and realised it was Chloe's father. He moved towards Ted and started eating his arm, but stopped when he heard the siren. He ran away. I was rescued, but my soul was damaged. No one believed me about the Wendigo, and they thought I was crazy. I was the only survivor, and I felt guilty. Ted, Jesse, Floyd and Caramel didn't deserve any of the things that happened to them. Charlie, we're at Grandma's place already, one of the twins shouted. I snapped out of my reverie and saw the twins running out of the car and into the house. You guys slept all day, but woke up as soon as we got here, I said and shook my head. Grandma and my parents came out of the house to meet us. The twins ran into Grandma's arms in excitement. Why are you so late? Grandma asked, faking annoyance. I am sorry, I didn't mean to drive so late. Don't worry about it, she answered, and pulled me toward her warm embrace. She released me slightly and looked at my face. I have a surprise for you. Really? Mr. Rivers, Chloe's father, walked towards me smiling broadly. Hi, Charles. I stared at him dumbfounded and stared at my grandma. I figure you would want to connect with your friend's father. Yes. Yes, I know so. Thank you for watching and or listening to this video. Again, if you enjoyed it, please go ahead and hit the like button. And if you don't already, go ahead and subscribe to my channel and select the notification bell so you don't miss out on any of my future uploads. Also, please leave a comment on this video letting me know what you thought of it. Comments really help with the YouTube algorithm and will really help my channel to grow. If you have a story you would like me to narrate, please email it to me at stories at daredeverall.com. I'm now past 50,000 subscribers to this channel, so I'm halfway to my next major milestone. Thank you to everyone who is continuing to subscribe to this channel and contributing to its growth by liking videos and leaving comments. Once I get to 100,000 subscribers, my plan is to reward you all with an epic video with over three hours of original content. If that is the sort of thing you want to hear, please help keeping this channel to grow. If you want to support my channel even further, there are a number of ways you can do so. You can consider leaving me a tip for this video via my PayPal. Link is included in the description. Check out my Teespring store and consider purchasing one of my shirt designs. 
And some people have been asking in the comment sections if I've done any audiobooks, and the answer to that is yes. On Audible, there is a book, Punch, by J.R. Park, that I narrated. I do get a small royalty if you decide to purchase that. It's a revenge slash a horror novel that was a lot of fun to narrate. I'd like to do some more in the future at some point. Thanks again for watching.